Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday morning service at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship here in Laguna Beach. My name is Pamela Floodman, and I will be serving as the worship associate this morning. Don West Jr. will be leading our service and our audiovisual, and also handling the Zoom tech. Um, and our audiovisual um, assistant this morning is Dara Skarecki, and we're delighted to have Sue Bredice here with us as our guest musician today. I want to call attention, I guess, to the recognition that our area today is preparing for what we're anticipating is going to be um, uh, difficult weather later today with rain and with wind, and yet still I see there are those of us who have chosen to come out here to be here together in person. There are people who've joined us by Zoom, and it's really wonderful to be together this morning. Today we will be having the fourth of our series of four services that have made up our summer unique programming series this summer. So summer unique programming, we call them our summer up series. And this year our summer up program has focused on close reading and discussion of a book written by the Reverend Tom, doc, the Reverend Dr. Tom Owen Toll, who is also a friend and frequent visitor with us here at UUFLB. And Reverend Tom's book that we've been discussing this summer is entitled Home Stretch, The Art of Finishing Life Well. When I purchased this book to read this summer, I enjoyed reading also the online description of the book, which included the following words. Ours is increasingly a world of elders. By 2050, the number is projected to grow to almost 2 billion, and it's projected that for the first time in human history, the world will have more people 60 and over than children under age 15. And there exists a hunger in our current society to engage this difficult yet enlivening challenge of life's home stretch. So this book, Home Stretch, The Art of Finishing Life Well, um, was written in part to assist us in balancing our core pursuits of solitude and quest, joy and service, surrender, and legacy. So each Sunday over the past several weeks, Don West Jr. has led us in a discussion of the difficult yet enlivening challenges that are raised as we engage with this material that Reverend Tom Owen Toll presents to us in Home Stretch. And today we will be engaging with the final two chapters of the book. So we are so glad you have joined us today for worship at UUFLB, and we look forward to the discussion that we have today, and we look forward to the future and all that we can achieve together. Each Sunday, anywhere there is a service held in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a chalice is lit. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our faith. So if you have joined us this morning by Zoom, I invite you to light a chalice within your home. And here within the sanctuary, I have invited one of our new members and friends, Phyllis Hale, to please come forward and light our chalice this morning. The chalice lighting words that we've chosen this morning were written by the Reverend Judith L. Quarles who was a passionate advocate for social action in her local communities and beyond. And she served Unitarian Universalist congregations in Western New York State and also in Canada. At this hour, in small towns and big cities, in single rooms and ornate sanctuaries, Many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love, justice, and truth. 
So thank you very much, Phyllis, for lighting our chalice this morning, for being enthusiastic to, to perform this, um, this service for us this morning as we begin our time of worship. At UUFLB, we are a welcoming congregation with a commitment to work together to actively dismantle systemic racism and oppression in all of its forms. This land on which we join together in worship is the ancestral territory of the Ahashemen and the Tongva tribes. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care of the earth and for their teachings. And with humility, we commit to learning and to working on behalf of justice. Whoever you are, whomever you love, and really no matter your age or your gender, your ancestral background, whatever sincere questions you bring with you today, really we know that whatever has brought you here this morning, we welcome you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as spiritual and ethical beings. We welcome you to our community where we commit to supporting each other as we work to make a difference in our world. Unitarian Universalists subscribe to no single religious creed, but have gathered a set of principles that guide us as we build a religious community together. The principles that Unitarian Universalist congregations affirm and promote are on the back of your order of service. And for those of you who are on Zoom um, and here in the sanctuary, they're also showing on the slides at this point. And if you haven't already picked up an order of service, you can pick up a copy in the back of the sanctuary. So throughout the service this morning, if you are here with us in the building, I do invite you, if you wish, to come forward and light a candle here in the sanctuary, if you wish, in recognition of whatever you are carrying in your heart as you join us for worship today. It is such a joy for us to have guests on Sunday mornings. If we have anyone who's joined us for the first of, or second time today, we'd like to get to know you. And if you're comfortable doing so, I'll invite you either from the Zoom screen or here in the sanctuary to please stand and share with us your name, where you are from, and what brings you to visit our church today. I'm not sure on this stormy Sunday, though, whether we have any guests visiting us, um, but I'll start by inviting those on Zoom. Is there anyone on Zoom today who is joining us for the first or second time? Looks like not. Okay, great. Well, now what I'd like to do is return to a part of the service that is something we frequently did as a community before, um, before the start of the pandemic. And we will be reincorporating this part into our services now as we go forward. I'd like us to take just a moment here in the sanctuary, or for those of you on Zoom, um, for us to turn to our neighbors for a quick greeting and so that we can offer personal welcome to old and new friends who are here today. So if we can take just a minute to greet each other and um, then we'll continue with the service. Good Sunday morning, Zoom fellows, Zoom ladies. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all for choosing to be here today. Um, and we hope that after the service, everyone has a few minutes to stay and enjoy coffee and conversation. I had written here coffee and conversation on the patio, but of course we won't probably be using the patio today. Um, but please stay to have a chance to connect with each other and we'll keep the iPad connection open too so that we can connect with the folk who've joined us by Zoom. So welcome to all. Our centering thought today is from the um, is from the book that we have been reading in fact it's a quote that is quoted within the book so it's a quote from an author named James Hollis 
who wrote a book in 2001 called Creating a Life, Finding Your Individual Path. And Reverend Tom Owen Toll chose to quote this quote in the book in the chapters that we're reading today. In fact, it was the quote for the chapter on soul work. So I'm going to share this with you as our centering thought today. One can be an old fool just as what easy, easily as one can be a young fool. And all of us were young fools. A sage is a person who has come to know what is true for him or her. One who has been refined by the fires of suffering and achieved a modicum of peace with what they know, believe, and live. So many thanks to everyone here at UUFLB who works together each week to create the opportunities that allow us to worship together and to be together in community through um, weekly events such as the Zoom at noon, noon discussion group. I really do want to thank our board and our worship committee. Both of these groups meet at least on a monthly basis and have met in this last week and everyone who helps to prepare each week for our Sunday morning worship services and for events like the Zoom at Noon discussion group. And so if any of you are looking for another way to become involved, um, please speak with any of us. Working together in this way, connecting with each other is the way that we build community as our strong base from which we go out to make a difference in the world. For our announcements this morning, um, I think my main announcement was that there is the Zoom at noon discussion group on Mondays at noon. Speak with anyone here within the fellowship if you're looking to find a way to join that group. Um, and then also a reminder that we are as a community looking for additional individuals who wish to join us in providing meals once a month for our um, neighbors who are without homes. And we do this in this community on the first Thursday of each month. And the group that coordinates these meals really is looking to see whether there are other individuals who want to commit to occasionally providing one piece of that meal service. So um, yes, we have other announcements here. I see two of them. So if you tell me, then I'll also repeat it so the folk on Zoom can hear. Oakley? Excellent. Oakley has reminded us that if you are participating in or if you volunteer to participate in providing a component of a meal for the alternative sleeping location, there are funds here within our fellowship so that you can be reimbursed for the, um, for the purchases that you make towards that meal. So what we need more than anything is um, hands and people who want to commit to be part of preparing a meal. And if you do so, you can either choose to be reimbursed and you would just need to submit the um, information about what reimbursement is needed to, um, to our, our um, treasurer, Tom McGrew, or you could submit that information and get documentation from Tom that that's been a formal donation that you've made, or you can just choose to contribute it um, without requesting either reimbursement or the documentation. But um, again, it's, it's really our ourselves and our hands and our commitment to be involved in providing this that's needed because there are funds within the community to help support that. Thank you, Oakley, that's so important. Rachel?
Excellent. I knew I was forgetting announcements. So in a minute, we're going to be talking about the upcoming services. But next Sunday, we are working to plan for there to be a potluck lunch or possibly pizza lunch after the um, service. And um, Don West Jr. will be here in person next week leading the service. So it's, a, it's a, just another great way to build community and probably pizza rather than potluck. Is that right? Excellent. Okay, very good. Phyllis, you had something to announce as well. Yes. Right. So if you choose to volunteer to be part of the feeding the um, feeding the homeless, feeding those without homes, um, Bruce and John coordinate for this first Thursday and either you provide it to them on the first Thursday in because they live in Laguna Hills or there's a meeting place at a bank near Laguna Hills at about six o'clock on that first Thursday and then a meeting place in the Laguna Canyon at 620 on the first Thursday. That's where I meet them right at the um, sleeping location. And so what you do is commit ahead of time to which part of the meal they need that you're going to provide and then you coordinate in one of those three ways to get it to them and Bruce and John are our um, coordinators who then put that all together and bring it in to the sleeping location at this time we don't have people actually going into the alternative sleeping location to serve the meals so it's really just coordination and again it's it is it's something we've been participating in here at UUFLB in one way or another, pretty much I think since the start of this congregation and most recently in, in, in community with the ASL. So um, we can get you more information and put you in touch with Bruce and John if you're interested. Okay, great. So I think what we're ready to do now then is move to our, op oh no, wait a minute, I want to announce the upcoming services first. Um, Don, if you could put the slide up with our upcoming services. Next week will be August 27th, and as we said earlier, Don will be coming here to Laguna Beach in person to lead the service next week. And this is an ongoing part of a series that we've been holding about every month um, during this calendar year where we're focusing on the UU principles, again, the principles as you'll see them on the back of your order of service. And next week we're going to be focusing on the sixth principle and I will read the sixth principle for you. As Unitarian Universalist congregation, we affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. So our focus next week will be on the sixth principle and what it means for us and what it means in our lives. The following Sunday on August 27th, um, no, that is August 27th, sorry. The following Sunday on September 3rd, Bill Steiner will be joining us again here at UUFLB. And Bill is a friend of the congregation for many years and is coming to talk with us on September 3rd, which is the Sunday of Labor Day weekend. So this will be our Labor Day service. And Bill is a lawyer with a focus in a labor law practice. And each year as he comes and talks with us, he brings us perspective on some of the current challenges in the current work that's going on in um, support of labor. Uh, particularly within California and Southern California and more broadly as well. So I know that will be a wonderful service with Bill on September 3rd. And then on September 10th, Reverend Celia Young will be returning here to UUFLB for a service with us again as part of her series this year. And this service is going to focus on um, intergenerational relations and September 10th is actually Grandparents Day and so I hope you're able to join us for these upcoming services. Now I invite you to join us in using your voices and using music to celebrate our time together here as a community. Our opening hymn this morning is number 1021. It's a favorite hymn written by Bill Withers. 
and um, the hymn is called Lean on Me. I know it's familiar to everyone. Um, and please stand as you are comfortable in body, mind, or spirit and join our guest musician, Sue Bredice, in singing number 1021, Lean on Me. We'll do that afterwards. Great. Sometimes in our lives we all have pain, we all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. Okay, yeah. there we go. So now let's see. I see Candy nodding. Is your nod mean, Candy, that you're hearing me speak? Correct. Wonderful. So for those of you who are on Zoom, you just missed most of a wonderful, rousing um, celebration of Lean on Me together with Sue. Um, however, um, we now have you with us again, which is lovely. Don, we're about to do our unison affirmation. If you're able to share the screen, for the unison affirmation. I think we can move forward with our service. We were all set to do a call and response for unison affirmation. But I think if Dawn is able to share the slide on the screen, um, we can now take a moment to remind ourselves why we do come together as a community, even when it's challenging on a day when there's storms pending and when our internet goes out. So I invite you to read these words, the words of our unison affirmation. I invite you to read them together when and if it feels right for you. And for those of you who've joined us by Zoom, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone to join your voice together with the voices here in the fellowship building. So please join me in together, together in reading. Love, love is, is the spirit, spirit of this fellowship. fellowship and service, service is, is its law. law. This is this our great covenant, covenant to dwell well, together, together in peace, peace, to seek the truth, the truth in love, love and, and to help, help one, another. one another. So thank you all for joining today, for being a part of our community, for committing to make a difference. We have come to a time in our service to briefly share the important events that have touched our lives in the past week. The joys which we share are amplified so that they extend beyond ourselves into our community. And when we share our sorrows, we provide for each other the support and the care that are really vital for each and every one of us. So during this time of sharing our joys and concerns, we will pause the recording of the service. Recording again at this time. And I acknowledge really that it is as much a blessing for us to be able to give as it is to receive. And I truly believe this and feel this each time we gather together in community. Because in our self-governing and self-sustaining community, we recognize that it is our responsibility to give and to receive and to do both well. And we depend on the love and the generous contributions from our members and our innumerable gifts of time, compassion, humor, and our financial contribution. So as we're during this time of offering passing a basket within the fellowship, you'll also see information on your screen providing additional ways in which you can give, either electronically or by sending a check to the fellowship.
So please join us now in singing to each other these words of sincere gratitude. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, and together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, and together we share, and from this we Dara, I think you now need to turn the sound to the computer sound because Dawn will be leading us into a time of meditation. So I invite you to find a comfortable position Make sure you're sitting as upright as is possible for you. And let's take a few deep, purposeful breaths together. Let's breathe in and breathe out. Collectively, let's all breathe in together and breathe out. Breathe in and now. Let's continue to breathe together as we contemplate and meditate and move into a place of discussion on the home stretch. Deep breaths in and out. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. So we are in part four of our 2023 Summer Up series. We're looking at the book Home Stretch by the Reverend Dr. Tom Owen Toll. Um, and just as a quick recap, he's currently 81. He was 67 at the time that he wrote this book. And we're looking at chapters eight which chapter eight is soul work, descent into the netherworld. And then we're gonna look at the final chapter, which is a short chapter on surrender, letting go and letting be. And so in chapter eight, he takes us uh, on a journey into the four dragons in, in chapter eight. So, soul work descent into the netherworld and in the netherworld he says we're going to find four dragons and those four dragons consist of angst anger aloneness and anguish um there's a fine line between bravely facing our angst and being downright foolhardy or taking stupid risks with valuable things 
and the dragons he gives us a lot of different examples but the dragons um are, are are challenges but he says they're also the protectors of our most valuable possessions and one of the things that i found interesting is he points out that how in, in western society we have a very very dualistic black and white view of good and evil um and it starts to affect our, our viewpoint and it starts to create some angst in us because of our western psychology and, and he shares something that i found very interesting that i didn't know exactly this way before reading this in the book and that's that in hinduism they, they don't recognize that there is anything that is absolutely good or absolutely evil everything exists as a mixture of both and, and he shares a, a vignette about the diwali festival and how it's a celebration of an evil demon because of the the difference in worldview the evil demon is is not all evil and and he takes us through angst and it's unabashedly inviting for us to take the the eastern route of shaking hands at the four uh, fearsome dre dragons of elderhood angst anger aloneness and anguish um and then he tells us a story about aretha and and how she deals particularly with angst and and on and only it's only been in recent times in my late 70s when i mustered enough guts to face my fears getting to know them on a more intimate basis that they've slowly but surely lost some of their iron grip on me what usually works for me is to schedule a brief time she does it usually in the late morning when she's fully awake she sits down and she takes one of her fears and for that one session she invites that particularly that particular anxiety into her consciousness and and she says i like to open my hands like a cup and and hail the anxiety to her hands and and there her and her scary friends sit and she says it has not always been successful but she's on her way to freedom's land which my take is that just going through the practice and and facing her her fears and facing the things that cause her angst has given her the ability to lessen them some and he says that one of the four dragons is anger and he warns that anger is is something that we cannot be rid of but that we can be more strategic and and have uh a more useful focus to how we dispatch our anger and he gives us a, a warning that suppressed anger can result in insomnia, high blood pressure, fatigue, habitual sarcasm, accident proneness, gastrointestinal disorders, headaches, verbal or physical outbursts of anger, um, and these can all be destructive to our health. And I find that interesting that um, it's our anger and so there's a guy named author who he refers to and what author tells us is that when he was a kid he was a powder keg and he learned masking behaviors which were not necessarily healthy behaviors because he was doing that he was suppressing his anger and he was swallowing all of his anger in in his middle years and and what author tells us is that as he's entered into the home stretch he started to embrace what reverend tom suggests which is to have a strategic anger and where our anger is is released and we allow and we allow uh we allow it so that it's not suppressed he then takes us into aloneness which is is one of the things that uh he says in the home stretch is is such a challenge uh and in in his discourse on aloneness he he points out that we come into this world alone and we leave alone and it's the things that happen in the middle. And if you if you take uh, a less cynical view, he invites us to think about it uh, in in terms of the spirit of, of the Hebrew meaning of the word death. And in, in the Hebrew, the word death literally translates to being gathered unto one's people. And he says, therefore, the other side is that communion brings us into existence. And we do come in alone, but it's communion that brought us into existence. And, and through our actions and our choices, 
and the things that we do in our regular uh, routine, especially in the home stretch, communion can be the way that we exit because we've developed that community. Um, and the last of the four dragons is anguish. And he talks about it uh, referencing the shortest verse in the Christian Bible, which is, and Jesus wept. And he says that his elders, it's, it's particularly uh, a, a, an experience for uh, groans and tears is what he says. And, and, and he says it's understandable how the Nazarene was distraught over the rotten behavior that he was witnessing. And as elders, sometimes that is the same experience when you see somebody doing something and it's, it's going to cause you anguish. And sometimes the situation is such that you, or it is best for their own learning cycle and their own growth not to intervene. And then we're going to move into chapter nine where surrender, letting go. And I just find it interesting. It's, it's uh, only a few pages and on almost every page is the word surrender over and over and over again. Um, we have a limited number of autumns is how he puts it remaining. And as that number decreases, uh, it's very important that we surrender. Uh, he says, pointing out, I find this very interesting that Reverend Tom in this book has lots of references and allusion uh, and illustrations drawn from uh, the Nazarene, as he calls them, from Jesus and from the Christian Bible. Um, and he goes to Psalms 90 here and it says, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. And in Psalm 90, and in applying our hearts unto wisdom, we, we are talking about the home stretch and, and he references Henry Cadbury. Cadbury talks about how long he'd like to live. And he says, well, I don't want to live too long and I don't want to die too soon. And, uh, Reverend Tom then goes back again to Jesus of Nazareth, and he talks about how when he was on the cross, some of the last words that he uttered was, it is finished. And, and in that, he was surrendering himself back to the, his father and surrendering, 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 and letting go. And he says, it's going to be impossible at the end to surrender if we haven't exercised the muscle of surrendering and letting go. And I, I just thought about it as I was reading it, and I'm uh, very much not in a place myself of surrendering very much and letting go of very much. I'm still in an accumulation phase. And, and I was thinking about all of the things that in the back of my mind or the forefront of my mind, I, I still would like to accumulate. And I try to take that against Reverend Tom's suggestions and instructions on surrendering and letting go. And I, I think I'm, I'm going to have to adjust and, and recalibrate. So let me uh, let me open up the discussion with this. I like, like the practice of Aretha. Can anyone share a, a tool or technique that they found useful in how they handle the four dragons? She talks about using the cup. So is there anything that you do in your journey, in your routine, in your, your daily practice or your spiritual practice that has to do with dealing with these particular four dragons that Reverend Tom brought to us in, in chapter eight? Angst, anger, aloneness, anguish. Is, is there anything similar to how she takes time in the mid-morning after she's awake and, and just spends time and focuses on one issue that she knows that is there and then sitting with that issue and contemplating and spending time with it she says that gives her space anything that anyone can share that that they do that's similar to aretha's uh engagement with the four dragons i see candy shaking her head a little bit i don't know if that means she has something to share Don, we're just getting set up here, if you don't mind, to be able to hear and speak from here. And Candy, I see you have something to share, which is great. Just let me get it set so people here can hear you as well. Can you test out? Yes. Testing, testing. 
Testing, taste, tasting, one, two, three, four, tasting. <laughs> you can hear her, right? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> well, I, I do a lot of um, meditating. While I knit and crochet every day, which really chills me um, out uh, from any angst I might have. It really is calming. It's a repetitive thing and doesn't take a lot of concentration and focus so that I can really uh, think in a very subtle way that's not pointed toward anxiety or anger. Uh, it's calming. It's like meditating. And so I'm grateful for that. And of course, I was before I mutilated myself. Um, <laughs> I was exercising quite a bit, which is also helpful, really helpful. I was attending classes, which gave me community since I live alone and um, exerting energy communally, which was very beneficial. And I always turn to serving others whenever I can to calm myself and make myself feel productive. I like all of those. Thank you, Candy. Thank you for sharing. Art, exercise, community. Art, exercise, and community. So does anyone in the building have something that they'd like to share with us? I see Harry raising his hand. Let's see. Take it away, Harry. Um, anger. Uh, I, I have my own way of dealing with it, but I read a quote yesterday that caught it pretty well. It said, um, if someone hits you with a stick, you don't get angry with the stick. Um, he said, <laughs> but hit you really is a stick. And what's hitting you is their anger. Uh, and they aren't in control. Uh, and therefore, you need to be react to them different uh, because they're not what's hitting you. It's what's controlling them. And my way of putting it is when you get triggered, uh, and anger is a good example of what you can get triggered into, uh, I go into what I call automatic pilot, and, and I'm possessed. I behave out of that anger and have no control. I don't get hit people or things, but my voice and everything, I behave in a automatic way. If I can become aware of being in that state while it's happening, sometimes I can step out of it. Um, and even if I can't become aware of it while it's happening, if I can become aware of it afterwards, which is often the case, I look back and say, oh, I was triggered, I was out of control. Then I can try and be more aware of it the next time. Uh, and so the idea is to be as conscious as you can of when your emotions have taken over and to learn from that. And, and, and what you do there, Harry, I call that the observer's chair. I do the same thing and I'm the observer, that quintessential self, my spirit, my soul, whatever it is that can hear my thoughts. I can witness what you're talking about, and I try to exercise that same amount of control so that I can step in and say, hey, cut that out, dude, especially on the anger side of my spectrum. Rachel, you came up to the front for us. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I really enjoyed these last two um, chapters. and. Don, your question, which is so interesting, it reminds me, um, as many of you know, my mother got her doctorates uh, when she was 60. And one of the exercises she did, because she got it in um, psychology, was you choose six to eight emotions, you give them a color and a form, and you bring them all to a table. And this is what I was reminded of that exercise because she did it with us. And what do they look like? And what are they saying to you? What color do they take and how much? Because I find for me, when I bring fears to the, you know, it's, and it changes. So if I'm bringing fear to me, that's like a white nebulous fog throughout the room because it's pervasive in my life and recognizing that. Sometimes joy is blue and too small. And anyway, it's just a way to get in touch. And so going through introspection, I guess, is a way for me to look at the angst and play with um, what am I really feeling? Because I don't know if I ask myself that enough. Thank you. Well, 
one Rachel the the descriptions you give I feel like someone who took some of those classes that your mom was involved with doing her doctorate work wrote a movie and there's a great children's movie that showed the emotions with the colors and they stole that but I had I had never thought of it as an exercise or how to utilize it the way you did. So thank you for gifting that new tool. That's, that's the, the four dragons for me were all com the four the four dragons for me were were wrapped up in one person, my stepfather, who abused me as a kid. And I finally came to terms with the four dragons as one person when he died because I was the one that was was gifted with the choice of, of letting him go. And that was very powerful for me. I've not experienced anger, angst, or or aloneness, or any of the other. The what's the other one? Uh, anger, angst, aloneness, and anguish. 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 Thank you. I've not experienced that since. Uh, so thank you very much. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that has? something that they'd like to share with us on how they might approach or interact with the four dragons angst anger aloneness anguish well seeing none i'll take us to the next thing that i thought was very interesting which was reverend tom talked about his uncle uncle renee and his uncle renee had a, a very specific plan and his plan was to be immortal and so I just had a curiosity question because I've toyed with it myself. Um, and, and that question is, is anybody like Uncle Renee? Is there anybody that their, their plan is that they're going to be immortal and they're not going to do this home stretch thing? They're just going to go on the immortal path. Or was that anyone's plan at some point in the past and what changed? Just curious. Anybody on Zoom? Well, I'm going to take up the Zoom space since I see no takers and 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 share that um, I had a very specific plan once I read Bram Stoker's Dracula that I was going to be immortal because I read Bram Stoker's Dracula and it gave me the idea that it was a possibility and I figured that there must be some way without drinking blood to do this immortality thing and there's lots of other movies that have fed into my youthful desire uh, to be immortal. And, and so if, and only if there's a way that I can stop aging, I will take on the immortality run. But as I have not found any true path to the, uh, fountain of youth and immortality, I am very much engaged in paying attention to all of the instructions in this book. Cause I was saying before we started today to candy that I, I think for my generation, life expectancy is going to be somewhere around 100 as it continues to bump up with medical advances. So I put myself right at the middle point as I approach 50. And I said I'm in, I'm in an accumulating and growth phase still in my life. And yet this experience over the past five weeks with you guys reading Reverend Tom's book has really calibrated and fine-tuned some of my approach and some of my desires out of how I would like to go the next 15 or 20 years as I prepare to enter into the home stretch. Um, so quickly coming to the building to see if we have any takers just on the immortality I have, question. I have something. Um, go for it. So I'm, you're, you said you're nearing uh, 50, I'm nearing 25. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm totally a different, but when I was little, I used to think 100 was really old and you die after you turn 100. So I think I will probably be going up, up that. I, I always think, cause I was born in 1999. So I always thought like, I'm going to get into the next century. <laughs> um, so hopefully I do that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Rachel has something to add in here too. And this is not from a child's book. Um, the, um, just really quickly, um, what I found was so interesting also in uh, chapter eight was how would you spend the last 10 minutes of your life? And so if you're planning on living forever, maybe you're not thinking that way. But when I first looked at it, I thought, no, 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 how he 
showed that he would spend the last 10 minutes, you know, like maybe only two minutes saying I love you to people. And now I've changed it. And in looking at those last 10 minutes, I wonder why aren't I doing that now? So. That, that's, a, that's a great question, Rachel. And I have a, a couple of friends who are transplant survivors and because the situation prior to their transplant was such, they have a, a view on life that they are doing a lot of that now and, and encouraging others to, 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 to live more fully again, which is what was here in, in the home stretch. So final thoughts, this has been a, a, a four week journey and exploration of Reverend Tom's uh, instructional short piece it's not a tome so i can't call it a tome but the art of finishing life well are are there any thoughts or or final things as rachel shared that came up like why aren't i doing this now is there anything that anyone else would like to share with us i see carolyn's hand coming up so we're coming to you carolyn carolyn from sacramento you have the yeah. <laughs> no i just wanted to mention that when the situation occurred to me, how I was defrauded, I was so angry at them. And then I was angry at myself. And then when I sat, sat down and thought about it, I thought, really, this is a learning experience. And if I can share it with others and help them learn too, then perhaps I've taught some other people. And that's my mission in life to teach. So that's it. Thank you. So gracious and that's that is absolutely beautiful. Anyone else have any final thoughts? Seeing none, I am going to invite our talented guest musician Sue to come up and lead us in our closing song. It's going to be hymn number 100 uh, from the Gray Hymnal. I have peace. I've got peace like a river. Number 100, I've got peace like a river. So Sue, the mic is yours. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow in my soul. I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow in my soul. I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops, got tears like the raindrops in my soul. I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops, got tears like the raindrops in my soul. 
I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain in my soul. I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain in my soul. I've got strength like a mountain in my soul. Thank you so much, Sue. As Pam comes forward to extinguish our chalice today, if you've lit one at home, now is the time for us to blow it out. As we extinguish our chalice today, its flame shall go out, but its light will endure, and we shall carry the mantra that Reverend Tom gave us in our hearts. Spirit of life and love, fill my body with healing kindness. And now, as you're able, let's make a circle in the fellowship, and Sue will lead us in our closing song, <clears throat> Let There Be Peace on Earth. peace on earth and let it begin with me let there be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be with earth as our mother we are family let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me